Okay, so we're going to start out here with particle motion, which is basically functions describing motion. You're often given a position function, usually in the form x of t. Okay? Of course, the position function has time as its input, velocity being the derivative of position. I don't think I covered this in detail yet, which is why I'm covering it now. Velocity is the derivative of position, is the derivative of position x prime of t equals v of t. Sorry if you can't really see that. x prime of t equals v of t. And in the same sense, the derivative of velocity is acceleration. So x double prime of t equals v prime of t equals a of t, acceleration. All right? So pretty easy topic to understand. And uh, you would see these position, velocity, acceleration functions when we talk about something called particle motion. And the entirety of particle motion revolves around being able to interpret all of these different equations in context. Okay? So, an example of a problem you might be given is where you're given x of t, you're given a position function, for a particle that moves unilaterally across the x-axis, okay? And you're given it as uh, 3x squared plus 4x plus 2, all right? Let's say it's that. And uh, you're given some subparts to the FRQ. You're given, like, find a function for the velocity of the particle and you would just differentiate the position function, you would get that. Another uh, type of uh, subpart you would get is uh, something along the lines of um, determine at what time at what times s in parentheses because it'd be too good of them to outright tell you whether there's more than one time or not. At what times the particle is at rest, and the particle is at rest when the vol velocity is zero. Makes sense, right? So you take your velocity function, and you set that equal to zero, and you solve for t. That would give you the times that the particle is at rest. Often this is coupled with a second question that states, at what position is the particle at rest. And if it asks you what position is the particle at rest, you would simply do out this problem, solve for t, and now that you know the times when the particle is at rest, you plug the time into the position function, and that gives you the position of the function, of the position of the particle, when the particle is at rest. They often ask you something just about average rate of change, but they usually do that with the second derivative, just to uh, slip you up. So one problem would be like, find the average acceleration of the particle on some interval, let's say, on t equals 1 to t equals 2. And this is basically testing, do you know uh, how to interpret an average rate of change? Because the average acceleration is v of 1, I'm oh, sorry, v of 2 minus v of 1 over 2 minus 1. A lot of kids see average acceleration and they do a of 2 minus a of 1. That's, that's not what this is, okay? Average acceleration is an average rate of change. It's the average of the derivative. So you're taking an, um, an I'm gonna call it an imperfect derivative here. That's what this equation does, okay? So you can't take the derivative of acceleration and get acceleration. You need to do the average rate of change or a type of derivative of velocity to get average acceleration, okay? So that's pretty much all of particle motion. It's 
uh, not one of the hardest topics to understand, but it's going to uh, play a very big part in serving as the type of problem set for the next big application of the derivative, which is graphical analysis. So let's move on to our first application, and these are going to be in ascending order of difficulty. So if you're having trouble with uh, something, try rewatching the video because this is going to get progressively harder. So first we have got the MVT. Like the IVT, it's an abbreviation. It's abbreviated meaning the mean value theorem. Okay? So the mean value theorem states that if a function is both continuous and differentiable, or just differentiable, because remember, if it's differentiable, it has to be continuous. If it's differentiable on the closed interval a to b, and let's select two points a to b, let's try this is point a, and let's say this is point b. If a function is continuous on the closed interval a to b, then there must exist some value c such that f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Now in English, what's that saying is that if we take the average rate of change, abbreviated as such, if we take the average rate of change from a to b, and if you remember from our first derivative video, average rate of change is a secant line, it's a straight line that touches the graph in two points, and uh, shows the average slope, or the average rate of change, between those two points. And it also states that somewhere on the interval, the average rate of change, the secant line, must equal the instantaneous rate of change. Instantaneous rate of change, or the tangent line. So, there must be some point where the secant line that connects points A and B is equivalent to the tangent line at some point on the graph. And if you look closely, if I draw a tangent line here, let's say, you'll see it's the same exact line. Alright, so that's it practiced on the graph. On uh, an AP exam, maybe it would be part of an FRQ, maybe it's part of a multiple choice. The question would ask you, first, must there exist some value c such that f prime of c equals the average rate of change? It pretty much copy-paste from the wording of the MVT. Must there exist some value c? And if some value c exists, what is that value c? So for the first part of the question, does a value c exist? you would just have to check if its derivative is continuous, or if it's differentiable. Those two sentences mean the same thing. If a function is differentiable, that means its derivative is continuous. A C, C exists if the function is differentiable. If you check if it's differentiable, then it exists. And then, you need to find the average rate of change, and you're going to get some number, you're going to get some constant for that and you're going to find f prime of x, and you're going to set it equal to that sum constant, and then you're going to solve for x. And that x will be your c, okay? Because once you solve for x, x is no longer a variable, it's a constant, so there you go. There is a derivation of the MVT called Rolle's theorem, it's pretty much the same thing as the MVT, though it's a special case. Rolle's theorem. Rolle's theorem states that 
if you have a squiggly diggly function, it doesn't have to be a squiggly, any function, and if you, any function, and if you pick two points on that function that are at the same y value, any two points on the function with the same y value, that means the function has to achieve a horizontal tangent line, horizontal tangent line indicating a slope of zero. It must achieve a horizontal tangent line at least once. You can see that right here. And this is a derivation of MVT, because if you take the secant line, if you take the average rate of change between the two points, you'll see the tangent line is also horizontal. Okay? You don't need to memorize the names. You don't even need to memorize Rolle's theorem as a separate theorem. It's just important to know that, to, to make that distinction instantly, that if two points are at the same y value, the average rate of change is, is zero. And second of all, the derivative must equal zero at at least one point, at at least one x value between those two uh, points, a to b. That's MVT. Pretty simple. I think it's pretty simplistic to understand. You probably won't need much practice with this. Ten problems would probably be enough. But let's move on. Again, these are progressively increasing in difficulty, so bear with me. Next, we've got local linear approximation, or short, just linear approximation. Okay? Now, you're going to see linear approximation pop up again much later if you're taking Calc BC where we evolve linear approximation into something much more complex known as the Taylor series. But that's back in series, that's the last unit of BC. Anyway, linear approximation is basically got the gist of this. If I have a function, let's say some trig function, sine, cosine, whatever this is, let's say I don't know what this function is, okay? Because I don't. I don't know what this function is. But I know that this point right here, let's call this uh, 4, 2. I know the point, and I know f prime of 4 means the slope of the tangent line at this point. f prime of 4 equals, what does that look like? I'd say 1.5. I'm given a point, and I'm given a derivative, okay? Linear approximation, or local linear approximation, states that I can draw the tangent line to that point, and I can use the tangent line to approximate where the function is going, okay? Now, if you'll see, when we are really close to 4, 2, the tangent line looks a lot like the graph. Therefore, the tangent line would be a useful approximation because the two are very similar to one another. But as we uh, distance ourselves further and further away from the point 4, 2, the tangent line and the function diverge. They're no longer useful. That's why this is often called local linear approximation because it's only effective locally in a constricted area surrounding the uh, point of interest. So the way you use local linear approximation to approximate the value of the function is let's say the question asks you to find f of 4.1. That's commonly how these questions are asked. They ask you 4.1 or 4 point some decibel. Okay, and the way you would do that is you would find first the distance between the two x values, 4.1 minus 4 equals 0 0.1, that is our change in x, delta x, and then you would find the derivative at your original point. Remember, you're not taking the derivative at the other point because you don't know where the other point is and you don't know the value of the derivative at the other point. You're not given what this function is. You're given a table of values. So you only have as much information as you need to do this. 
Anyway, once you get delta x, once you get the change in x, the formula for a uh, local linear approximation is f of 4.1, or whatever your other point is, is approximately equal to delta x multiplied by f prime of 4. And you can see that played out here on the tangent line. f prime of 4 is the slope of the tangent line. f prime of 4 is pretty much f prime of 4 is in this case the same thing as change in y over change in x. And we substitute like that. We get f of 4.1 is approximately equal to delta x times the change in y over the change in x. These cancel. Let's, let's play this out. 0 0.1 times 1.5 delta x times f prime of 4 equals 0 0.1 times 1.5 equals 0 0.15. That's our change in y. And let's add the original y value plus 2. Therefore, f of 4.1 is approximately 2.15. Okay, that's what our tangent line tells us. 2.15 is a point on the tangent line. It's not necessarily a point on the function. Remember, 2.15 is an approximation of the function. It's an exact value on the tangent line from uh, f prime of 4. That's local linear approximation. What a lot of kids uh, get tripped up on is uh, when they're given like let's say 4 comma 2 and they're asked for 3.9 so they have to go backwards again it's nothing different it's just the same formula you just gotta be careful with where your negatives are okay <sighs> next oh I remember foreshadowing this a while ago L'Hopital's rule L'Hopital's rule you know, I've seen other, uh, other people on YouTube who do calc review videos call this L Hospital's Rule. Please destroy their comment section, okay? They, they are not fit to teach calculus if they call this L Hospital's Rule. This is L'Hopital's, alright? You understand me? Good, good. It is now your moral obligation to bully anyone who calls this L Hospital. It is a disgrace to Newton and Leibniz, the inventors of calculus. Anyway, let's, let's move on. L'Hopital's rule states the following. If the limit as x goes to c of f of x evaluates to an indeterminate form of 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, etc., then the following rule holds. So this is our condition. We have to meet this condition in order to meet L'Hopital's rule following rule holds. Okay? And the rule is as such. Let's say you're given the limit as x approaches c of f of x over g of x. And that evaluates to a 0 over 0 indeterminate form. You're able to say that that is equivalent to the limit as x goes to c of f prime of x over g prime of x. And that will hopefully get you some limit L. All right, if you guys remember the two limits that I told you to memorize back in the limits unit, that was sine x over x, the limit as x approaches zero, and that was the limit as x approaches zero of cosine x minus one over x. And I told you that this first one equaled 1, and I told you this first, the second one equaled 0. 
and I told you there's no way we can prove that right now, you're just going to have to memorize it. Now, with L'Hopital's rule, we can prove that they equal what they do in fact equal, okay? So as I stated before in the limits video, these both evaluate to zero over zero in determinant forms. If you don't believe me, you can try it for yourself. So we can differentiate the top and bottom. This is not quotient rule. We're not doing low d high minus high d low all over low squared. We're just differentiating the top and we're differentiating the bottom. Do not get L'Hopital's rule confused with the quotient rule. L'Hopital's rule is used in limits. Quotient rule is used in derivatives. Okay? Derivative sine x. Everybody cosine x. Derivative of x. 1. All right, let's try our direct substitution. What's cosine of 0, everyone? 1. Hey, that looks familiar. Let's try the next one. Let's try the limit as x goes to 0 of cosine x minus 1 over x. 0 over 0. But that equals, what's the derivative of cosine x, everyone? That's right, negative sine. Derivative of x, 1. What's sine of 0? Zero? 0. Boom, bam, bop. Okay. <sighs> Now's where things start to get really tough. I'd like to introduce you guys to related rates. Okay? This topic is a topic that there's only so much I can teach you on it. The vast majority of related rates is, um, it's like 10 minutes of lecture, understand what a related rate is, and then from then on it's like six hours of practice because there's so many different types of problems, there's so many different ways they can be asked, there's, uh, it's an extremely general topic that you're, the only way to get good at it is to start seeing all the different types of problems. And there are probably a hundred different types of problems, okay? And each problem has its own unique way to be solved. So I'm going to work through one example for you so you guys can get the feel of it. But I think out of anything, this topic is what you're probably going to need extra help from me for. Khan Academy can do its best, but uh, Khan Academy is not the greatest for explaining individual steps. Well, it is good for explaining individual steps. Not when it comes to very long step problems like this. Anyway, let's get to work. So related rates, as the name may entail, involves you relating different rates of change to one another. Okay, and the way we do that is instead of doing what we were doing before, where we had dy dx, if you remember from the previous video, I stated that the long way of saying this is the derivative of y with respect to x. Okay, so we're going to need to do a little bit of a uh, little bit of a crash course here on differentials. If you don't know what a differential is, this is a derivative, this is a differential. It's like half a derivative, just the top or bottom half. This is a differential, dx, dy, those are differentials. Okay, so dy, what does this mean? Lowercase d indicates an infinitely small change in y, in this case in y. dx would indicate an infinitely small change in x, okay? infinitely small such that it is almost zero. And that's why dy over dx is the rate of change at a point, okay? Because it is a change in y over a change in x, two of which are infinitely small, right? This is opposed to delta y over delta x, which is a rate of change over a period, okay? 
these, this, these are both rates of change, and we're relating how y changes to how x changes. In this case, over a period of time. In this case, at an instant. Okay. What this tells us is, it tells us, how does y change when x changes? And that's slope. That's what a slope is. How does y change when x changes? And for that reason, every time you took the derivative of an x term, the derivative of an x term was always 1. Okay? Because if you're comparing something to the rate of change of x, and you compare x to the rate of change of x, that's x over x, which is 1. Okay? But if we took the derivative of y, and we take the derivative of y with respect to x, that's dy dx. What I'm trying to get across here is that you can differentiate different variables, okay? And you need to determine which variable you're differentiating them with respect to, okay? The variable that you're differentiating with respect to, in this case, x, if you differentiate with respect to x, that means the rate of change of x remains constant, and you're seeing how y behaves when the rate of change of x is constant. So in related rates, we don't differentiate with respect to x anymore, we differentiate with respect to t, with respect to time. That's what t stands for. So if I gave you the equation y equals x in a related rates problem, you would differentiate with respect to time. Whereas if you differentiated the left side, the derivative would be dy dt the rate of change of y with respect to time equals dx dt, the rate of change of x with respect to time. It's not dy dt equals 1, it's not dy dx equals 1, because the reason that we would always get 1 for this is when we tried to take the derivative of x, we would get the rate of change of x with respect to x. D with dx over dx equals 1. That's why the derivative of x is 1. Anywho, in a related rates problem, we're differentiating with respect to time. So a lot of the related rates problems in Calc BC are related to geometry. So because they're all related to geometry, you're going to need to memorize all the different geometric formulas. Geometric formulas meaning things like surface area of a cube, area of a cube, thus, area of a rectangular prism, area of a circle, area of a sphere, surface area of a sphere, circumference of a circle, area of a cone, surface area of a cone, area of a cylinder, all the geometric shapes. Uh, Pythagorean theorem, a squared a square plus b squared equals c squared. Uh, Sokotoa, sine equals opposite over hypotenuse. Every geometric formula is something that will be seen in implementation in related rates, at least in most of them. Some of them do their own thing, but you'll see those as you experience more related rates problems, okay? So, personally, my favorite uh, related rates problem is the lamppost problem. And I'm doing this as an example with you guys because it's one of the few related rates problems that I've discovered a shortcut to. Okay? And I'd rather me teach you the shortcut rather than you try the problem on your own not knowing the shortcut. So, the, a related rates problem generally has this format. Okay? A man is six feet tall. He is walking 
away from a lamp post that is 15 feet tall. His speed, speed of how fast he's walking away from the lamppost, his speed is four feet per second. Okay? As the light from the lamppost shines on the man, it creates a shadow. It creates a shadow. And your question would always come at the end after it gives you all this information. How fast is the man's shadow growing when he is, let's say, nine feet from the lamp post. Okay, so three pointers, or two steps and one pointer that I have for you guys. My advice, first and foremost, is in related rates problems, you must always give your answer with correct units. If it's not in correct units, it's wrong. If it doesn't have units, it's wrong. You need to have correct units, okay? So, there are two preliminary steps that you need to do well on any related rates problem. Step one, always draw a picture of the scenario. Always. It will help immensely. So we're given a man that is six feet tall and we're giving, given a lamppost that is 15 feet tall. So let's draw our lamppost. Okay, this is 15 feet. And we're given a man that's six feet tall and he is uh, standing nine feet away from the lamppost. He's given a man six feet tall. He's standing, not drawn to scale, obviously, nine feet away from the lamppost. Okay? We're given that his speed is four feet per second. Now, the be all end all of related rates, the major skill that related rates are testing, is how well are you able to associate the concept of what a derivative is. A derivative is a rate of change, okay? So if it tells you that his speed is four feet per second, that should immediately tell you that the rate of change of his distance from the lamppost is four feet per second. Four feet per second, okay? If his speed is four feet per second, that means the rate of change of his distance is four feet per second, okay? Let's call this uh, D for distance. No, let's call it A, because let's call it A for distance. DA DT is four feet per second. The derivative of the distance A with respect to time is four feet per second. That's something I really want to drive home for you guys. You need to identify where derivatives and distances and other factors play into these problems. Okay, so we got a man that's six feet tall. We've labeled that, check. We've got him walking away. The, uh, we know he's walking away from the lamppost because the rate of change of his distance is positive. Therefore, the distance is increasing. Okay. Walking away, we got that. His lamppost 15 feet tall, we got that. His speed is four feet per second, we got that. It creates a shadow. So the way it creates a shadow is we draw a ray of light from the lamppost. And we draw that down to the ground. And this distance right here is the man's shadow. It's abbreviated as S for the length of his shadow. I think that makes sense. 
at the shadow. And we're asked, how fast is the man's shadow growing when he's nine feet from the lamp? We got that nine feet from the lamp. Okay. This stumps a lot of people. It's generally a really hard, it's one of the harder related rates problems, okay? The only thing that would be harder than this is like a cone problem. You'll see the cone problems when uh, when Khan Academy decides to give them to you. Don't don't leave Khan Academy until you've seen a cone problem. Okay, you, you're gonna you're gonna need to know that. If you know that, you can solve everything. Don't leave until you've seen the hardest thing it can offer you. Anyway, the way, the really easy way to solve these is to draw two triangles. <laughs> Right here. Triangle one, triangle two. And like I said before, there's no set way to solve related rates problems. It's testing your logic. It's testing to see how well you can understand the problem. So the only thing is practice. Learn from, make mistakes, learn from them, and try to get a look at as many related rates problems as possible. Anyway. Lamp post problem. You draw two triangles. One triangle contains the man's shadow. One triangle contains part of the lamp post and touches the man's head. Okay? So, we know the man is six feet tall. Therefore, this part of the lamp post is six feet. And this part of the lamp post is nine feet. And since this distance and this distance are the same distance, this is also nine feet. Okay. Now the important thing about this trick is that these two triangles are similar triangles. Okay? 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and they've got the same angle here due to, um, what is it, uh, it's some parallel line geometry proof that I learned back in ninth grade. Well, what's the name of it? Uh, is it? It's same side exterior. These are, these angles are congruent because of same side exterior angles. If you took geometry, you know what I mean. Anyway, these two angles are the same, these two angles are the same, therefore they're similar triangles. And if we remember something about similar triangles, is that similar triangles, their sides are always in proportion. If we uh, identify the proportionality constant that differentiates these two triangles, then we can find out all the sides of the triangles. Okay, so let's look here. The man is six feet tall. This side of the triangle is six feet. This side of this triangle is nine feet. And if we multiply nine by two over three, we get six. Therefore, our proportionality constant is two over three. This triangle is two-thirds the size of this triangle, okay? Therefore, every side of this triangle multiplied by 2 over 3 gives us the corresponding side on this triangle. So we can do that here, and we can determine that the length of his shadow right now is 6 feet. But we're not asked for the length of the shadow. We're asked how fast is the man's shadow growing? We're looking for the rate of change of the length of his shadow. We're looking for ds dt. And how do we find ds dt? Well, the neat thing about similar triangles is that not only are their sides in proportion, but the rates of change of their sides are in proportion. Okay? We know the rate of change of this side. It's given to us down here. 4 feet per second. So if we take dA dt, if we take 4 feet per second, and we multiply it by our proportionality constant, 2 over 3, then we get 8 over 3, which equals ds dt. Now a lot of people would just box off 8 over 3 and leave it at that. Wrong! It's 8 over 3 feet per second. And that's full credit. Okay? So, the second step 
that I wanted to tell you guys is you need to be able to write out an equation to relate all of your variables, or at least the variables you need. But the shortcut that I just showed you allows you to circumvent the equation just for this type of related rates problem. So now that I have to, I need to show you a related rates problem that involves setting up an equation, because that's how 90% of all the related rates problems are going to work. So let, let me give you a really simple one, okay? You're given a circle. You're given a radius of the circle. You're given that the radius uh, is... Let me write the problem out first. Let's say, given that the radius of a circle is three meters, how fast is its circumference changing if the radius increases at two meters per second. Okay, that's your problem. This, there's no fancy geometry shortcut. This, you need to set up an equation, and you need to differentiate that equation so as to solve for different rates. Okay? This is a circle, and it's asking us for circumference, and it's given us radius. Hmm, what geometric formula do we know that relates circumference and radius? How about the formula for circumference of a circle? C equals pi d, or c equals 2 pi r. That's why I told you you need to um, memorize every geometric formula. Every geometric formula for every common shape. Like, don't memorize the formula for area of a dodecagon. Every common three-dimensional or two-dimensional shape. I've got a list of them up here if you guys need. Just pause, take a screenshot, whatever you need c equals 2 pi r, okay? But we're asked for how fast is the circumference changing? That means we don't want c, we want the rate of change of circumference with respect to time. dc dt, okay? So how do we get dc dt? We differentiate the left side of the equation. But if we differentiate the left, that means we get to differentiate the right. So let's do that dc dt equals 2 pi, that's a constant, that stays. The derivative of r is what, everybody? dr dt. Okay? So dc dt is what we're trying to solve for. We are given the rate of change of radius right here, 2 meters per second. We're given dr dt. So we just plug that in, dc dt equals 2 pi dr dt, 2 meters per sec. Therefore, dc dt equals 4 pi meters per second. And that's your final answer. Don't forget your units. Okay, if you're not sure what units, um, remember that distance or radius or circumference, anything that's, you know, a measurable distance is in meters. It's in a unit of distance. Anything that's a rate of change of that distance is in meters per time. And the rate of change of time will be given to you in the equation. Sometimes it's seconds, minutes, hours, days, etc. If you take the derivative of that, then it would be meters per second squared. Uh, distance per time squared. And as you keep taking the derivatives, the order of the uh, time unit will increase. Okay.